Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Conservation in a Post-Wilderness World, featuring Leah Barnett. The idea of ecological conservation has always been in evolution, and today it is responding to the challenges of climate change, as well as being enriched by the addition of indigenous practices and knowledge. Legislation still lags behind, as it tends to, but the field is undeniably expanding, which offers some encouragement for an uncertain future. One of the people who is helping to broaden the work and ethics of conservation is Leah Barnett. Leah is the Greater Gila Campaigner for Wild Earth Guardians, an organization that seeks to protect and restore the wildlife, wild places, wild rivers, and health of the U.S. American West. Born and raised in the foothills and arroyos of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains in New Mexico, Leah is thrilled to bring her love and deep reverence for the high desert country of the Southwest to the Greater Gila Campaign. Leah graduated summa cum laude from the University of New Mexico's Cultural Anthropology Program, where she focused on the ways the more-than-human world can be reimagined through anthropological theory and practice. Leah and I spoke on January 18th, and we discussed pinion pines, their ecological role, and how climate change is affecting them, the question of how the conservation movement should and can respond, public lands and their levels of protection and exploitation, the concept of wilderness, the necessity of the involvement of indigenous people and knowledge in conservation work, linguistic anthropology, the power and limitations of science, the question of how to encourage nature awareness to urban dwellers, the remarkable adaptability of plants, grazing permit retirements as a way of reducing ranching on public lands, and her visions for the future. If you appreciate this episode, please share it on social media. If you're watching on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe. To support the podcast financially, you can make a one-time donation to paypal.me slash colibri or become a patron at patreon.com slash colibri, which is spelled K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. Patrons get early access to podcast episodes plus exclusive content. For more info, visit radiofreesunroot.com. The music you're hearing is by Dr. Dreamchip of Portland, Oregon. See show notes for how to follow their work. Without further delay then, here is my conversation with Leah Barnett, Greater Gila Campaigner for Wild Earth Guardians. So maybe we could start with uh, you telling our listeners a little bit about yourself or a little bit about your background, just so they kind of know where you're coming from. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I am a born and raised New Mexican. Um, I grew up in the foothills just north of Santa Fe, uh, in the foothills of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. Um, very much identify with this place and this landscape. Sort of over time have recognized how much my time in this space has really shaped who I am, what I value, how I understand the world. Um, and a little bit of an unconventional uh, pathway to my current career in conservation. I forewent college um, after attending a prep school and instead spent some years freestyle skiing competitively in Colorado and then was supposed to go back to college and just felt like, like, why would anybody be so restricted by such a thing? Did a bunch of global travel, um, sort of dabbled back in school for over seven to 10 years and then just finished my undergraduate degree in May of 2019 from UNM in social oh, okay. anthropology. Okay. Um, I fell in love with linguistic anthropology as sort of a sub-discipline, um, loved thinking about language and the way it, it shapes not only our relationships, but our conceptions of the world. 
um, and really felt like I wanted to bring that lens to the environmental movement. So once I finished school, I volunteered for six months or so with Wild Earth Guardians, and then a position opened up as um, working in their Greater Gila campaign, uh, which is what I do now. So working on public lands issues, um, in particular, this large landscape protection campaign focused on the Greater Gila region where you are right now. Right, right. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm over in um, uh, near Cliff you know, uh, just mm -hmm. up from, like 30 miles from Silver City and the National Forest is, you know, literally two miles down the road, you know, from here. So that's often You're a place to, to so go for lucky. hikes. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's no, a special it's, place. Yeah. It's beautiful. Um, it's, yeah, the rugged landscape is just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Truly is. Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, I was reading a little bit of your writing and you wrote a really beautiful little trilogy about pinion pines and you were calling these story maps. Mm -hmm. And it was um, some really nice photos accompanied by text. And um, I too have spent a lot of time thinking about pinions and uh, a different species that grows in Nevada, but they're all, you know, they, they are uh, similar in so many ways and that they are key parts of the environment that they're in both for the biotic communities for the plants and for the animals, but also for, for humans. And so it's a really, I think that's a really good place to start when talking about um, conservation and about the uh, effects that have happened so far uh, and, and the, specifically the observations that you were making about uh, pinions and their effects on their uh, animal communities. Yeah. Yeah, that was, uh that was kind of the, the middle section of a pretty transformative period for me, just in terms of how I framed my relationship to the natural world. Um, that project was uh, sponsored by UNM's Art and Ecology Program. They're doing really incredible work over there. Um, Sabankar Banerjee was my professor. He's the land and chair um, in that program right now. And it was for his class, um, which was, we were thinking about the sixth mass extinction and sort of how to make it a, a locally felt experience for the students. Um, so I, you know, did a little bit of digging, came up with this recent um, academic paper published by Gian Fair in Los Alamos about the Pajarito Plateau and the um, decline in bird species um, in that region. And it was, you know, just so tragically ironic because pajarito in Spanish means little bird. Um, so the sort of, and it has a long history of, of being named in various indigenous languages for the birds that live there. Um, so just thinking about that as this very sort of potent symbol of what was happening. Um, and then that it all related back to the, to the pino and our state tree and, and the tree that's like been such a, um, just that green backdrop to so much of my childhood and my time in the landscapes of New Mexico and the Southwest. And that I'd spent so little time ever really differentiating between the pinyon and the juniper and, um, and really thinking about that as a, as a woodland, it's a forest, you know, it, it may not have the grandeur of um, the redwoods, but it's an incredibly important ecosystem, particularly in the deserts here. Um, and so digging deeper into that experience and spending more time with the pinyon and developing those two subsequent story maps about it um yeah and I go out now just walking from my house and um feel a sense of familiarity and just deep appreciation for and love of of the pinyon that it's such a cool and important tree right right and they have been suffering in health because yes. of climate change basically yeah yeah exactly mega drought in the Southwest has left them more vulnerable to the Ips, Confucius, the bark beetle. Um, and in some parts of the state, they're experiencing 90% die off of populations. The pinyon nut is an incredibly important food source for many different species of birds in addition to squirrels. Um, the pinyon jay, which is such a cool colonial cooperative species of jay. Um, you hardly see them anymore. We saw them this last year because we had that bumper crop of pinyon nuts. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, they are a, an indicator species. 
um, here in the Southwest. So it's a big deal that, that they're suffering and dying off. Right. So the bark beetle, this is something that we definitely hear a lot about, uh, not just in New Mexico, but in California too. And I think that there's a tendency, you know, not among conservationists necessarily, but in the media and maybe in the popular mind to sort of view the bark beetle as being a bad guy. But of course, that's not really how it works because the, the, the bark beetle is just who the bark beetle is taking advantage of the situation that is now more in, in, in their favor. Yeah. Yeah, you're so right. There's some um, really interesting acoustic ecology work that's been done um, to help stave off some of the bark beetle infestations. But I, one of the critiques of, I think it's David Dunn, maybe who's one of those acoustic ecologists, is sort of the villainizing of the bark beetle and, and folks saying like, that's not the real villain. The humans are, you know, like, just like you said, they're just, they're just being the bark beetle and doing what bark beetles do, you know, so yeah, you're totally right. 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 And so, but it remains though, that the, the trees have been dying. And so there's you, what you noted, or the people that you were talking to noted were some rather steep declines, uh, both in the number of species of birds seeing and in the raw numbers of birds too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much all species of birds found on the Pajari Plateau had, had been in decline, some up to 70%. So both in, in, raw numbers and in species richness, like you were saying. Right, right. And so this presents a really big challenge for from the, from the viewpoint of, of a conservation because the entire landscape is now changing from what, what it was before or how it was when we found it or whatever, right? And so maybe, maybe you could just talk about that, that, that challenge a little bit, like how does that how, how are we supposed to, how are we supposed to respond, I guess, you know? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know that, that the conservation movement really has a solution. I think one of, um, one of what I find so compelling about this campaign that I'm working for and sort of a lot of other campaigns around the nation and around the world, like this nature needs half um, movement or the 30 by 30 initiative, these, um, campaigns that are really thinking, how do we protect large chunks of land, thinking in terms of landscapes, rather than just, you know, 10,000 acres of wilderness. Um, and I think that in itself is a really important thing. Connectivity, conservation is sort of the way of the future. If we want to do our best to preserve species and, and face the biodiversity crisis, we need to be thinking bigger, because we know that Things exist as ecosystems. Um, they exist in relationship to one another, and they need space in order to, you know, if, if they have the ability to adapt um, to some of the, the climate changes that we're seeing, um, they really need that sort of large scale protection um, to, to work within these new climate regimes that we're facing. Right. And this is kind of a new way of thinking about it uh, in the last generation, isn't it? Um, thinking about it in the in, in terms of these larger spaces. I mean, I, I believe to me anyway, like it seems like I haven't heard about these things until the last few years. And I did just hear a podcast the other day about the uh, nature needs half. Um, so maybe you could just talk a little bit about these, this, this, these concepts. Yeah, um, I think the nature needs half sort of sprung directly out of some of the um, recommendations from like the EO Wilsonian camps um, and, and sociobiologists uh, thinking about, you know, the, the crises that we're in um, and the only way to really protect not only the other species on this planet that are vulnerable, but ourselves really, I think it, in their framing has been, you know, if, if humans want to survive on planet earth, um, we, need to, we need to protect half the, the terrestrial realm. Um, so that's the nature needs half the 30 by 30 is like a scaled down version of that. Um, and the goal for that is 30% of terrestrial marine ecosystems protected by 2030. Um, so that's not far away. It's, it's a, it's a pretty, uh, ambitious goal. Um, and there's a national campaign that's supported by many of the new cabinet members coming on board with Biden, um, as well as an international movement. So I'm hoping it's, it's building momentum, um, and I hope that 
ultimately when folks are thinking about designations and campaigns that should be integrated into that 30 by 30 framework, that it is just like we've been saying on a large scale, these, these larger landscapes that receive protective designations um, rather than just little bits here and there. Right, right. And when we talk about protected, I think that there's not as much protected now as I think a lot of people would assume, you know, because like national parks are protected to, to, to a, a larger degree than any other class of public land. Uh, many people who have not lived in the, in the West or around forests assume that national forest means that those are protected forests. Whereas when you start to get into it and are in those areas, you find out, oh no, that's just, those are managed forests and that the, the, you know, the, the forest service itself is under the department of agriculture, which certainly tells you something, you know? And so the amount that's protected in the United States is not very close to 30%. I don't think at this point would it, I remember hearing a figure in that podcast, maybe it was around 15 or something. I think that's right, 12 to 15%, yeah. Right, right. But then, you know, there's even some, there even is like a, a few isolated cases of ranching still happening in national parks, I know, you know? And like the Point Reyes National Seashore, which is kind of the seashore um, equivalent of a national park, has, has a lot of ranching in it right now. And they've been trying to, there's the activists who've been trying to push that out because they were supposed to leave. Um, and then, of course, there's everything that the Bureau of Land Management has, which is, you know, maybe the least protected of all of those, you know. Yeah. So and then there's and then there's wilderness designation. Right. So here in New Mexico was the first designated wilderness, I believe. Right. The Aldo Leopold yeah. wilderness. Right. And then the Gila wilderness. Oh, that yeah. was the first one. OK, that was the first one. Yeah. Right. And so and so that is a really interesting topic because wilderness because the wilderness movement well i think first of all that the the people who were on the forefront of the wilderness movement and of the wilderness legislation were um were were, were very well-intentioned people you know what i mean who were who were trying to do the best they could and what they were seeing was that so much of the land of the united states had been um really hammered by industrial development you know in so many ways. And so they were like, okay, let's set some aside. And, you know, the idea is that there will be no humans on it whatsoever, you know? And I totally understand that, that urge. Uh, however, as I started to study that concept more lately, and as I started to listen to different voices, I began to realize that there is, uh, there's definitely drawbacks or there's definitely, it's not the whole story that there's, 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 you know, something that's left out of uh, this concept of wilderness. And uh, maybe you'd like to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I want to say first, um, sort of in your lead in speaking to public lands and national forests and, and their vulnerability. Um, one of the things that we've been really trying to raise awareness of recently is the this land exchange that's taking place at Oak Flat oh, in Arizona. It's, it's terrible. It's a and that, and that is an example, like our public lands, they're not, they're not actually, it's all open to negotiation. You know, if there's, right. if there's enough profit involved, um, enough backing from extractive industry, I just encourage folks to do a little bit more digging, but the San Carlos Apache have been working so hard. It's, it's their sacred site, um, this incredible place called Oak Flat. Um, about 70 miles east of Phoenix. And we went last year um, for the march to Oak Flat uh, to support them. And it's all, it's all the same, um, you know, corrupt kind of dealings that went on between this multinational mining corporation um, and the US National Forest. And they just released the final environmental impact statement, which was sort of the last step in the um, land management processes before the transfer can be finalized. I think they have successfully filed a lien against Oak Flat um, that is gonna be honored. And there's a hearing about it on the 25th or the 27th of this month. But that's just, it's just another example of, of um, yeah, the vulnerability of our public lands generally. So, so thinking in terms of new designations, I mean, I, like you, I recognize um, the power of the idea of wilderness. And as a, as a designation um, sort of within the current framework that we use on a, on a federal land protection designation level, 
it's the gold standard. Right. And it's, and it's super antiquated, you know, and, and um, I was just revisiting the introductory chapter of um, Roderick Nash's Wilderness in the American Mind, where he does a sort of etymological unpacking of the term, um, which as someone who loves language and loves thinking about the history of language, um, I've, I found that to be so fascinating. But it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't do justice to the rich cultural texture of the lands of this country. Um, and like you were saying, for, for the majority of um, you know, the contemporary mobilization of that word and that idea of wilderness, it's, it's kind of considered something that's absent of mankind. Um, it's there for the wildlife and the forests and, and that's important and it's an incomplete story. Um, right. You know, it fails to recognize the fact like the Gila wilderness, you know, designated in 1924, America's first executively designated wilderness not long before that, you know, late 1800s, the, the Apache were violently and forcibly removed from their home, which was the Gila wilderness. Right. Um, and we don't hear that story. So I, as part of our campaign, we've really been thinking about um, how can we create a new standard of protective designations that are more inclusive, more equitable, more diverse, more just. Um, and I think one of the most powerful uh, feedback that I got in some of my conversations was with a, um, a man from Zuni Pueblo who said, why not use this big centennial celebration of America's first wilderness coming up um, June 3rd of 2024 as an opportunity to redefine wilderness, you know, oh, make it okay. about mm -hmm. the indigenous people of this country and, and the importance of these landscapes to them and their, their traditional heritage. And, um, and I was like, that, right on. Like that feels exciting and, and like the thing we need to do. Um, so obviously it's, it's trickier than that, far more complex, but that, that really drives me and inspires me just in right. terms of thinking about a, a redefinition, a reimagination of, of who and what wilderness is for. Right, right. Because the landscapes that the settler colonialists found across most of the United States were not unpeopled as the as the word is used, I think, in the legislation, that, that there were people everywhere. And most of the landscapes were the result of interactions between people and the, and the landscapes. In some cases, um, this was not so well known. Well, I think it was not so well known for a couple of reasons. One, because the diseases hit out ahead of the settlers. And so, so many Native people were killed before the settlers even had a chance to get there and see them and see what they were doing. So that's part of it. And then another part of it is that the land management that they were doing was so different than the European model that they didn't recognize it as land management, you know? And yeah. so, so, so when we look at a landscape and we're like, okay, how can we, how can we protect this as it was? Or how can we, you know, even more complicated, restore it to how it was, you know, too many times there's not looking at the, oh, but how it was, was not absent of, of, of human effect at all. It was about a relationship. You know what I mean? So, so, so we, we have to talk about how to bring that relationship, you know, back in. And that, that's just the part that I think that is, is not generally understood, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and that's where we emailed a little bit about this, but I think the prospect of some kind of framework of tribal co-management um, mm -hmm. feels really powerful. And I, I was realizing sort of in preparing for this that I, there's a stereotype of the ecological Indian that I think it's important right. to not subscribe to as well in these, mm -hmm. in these conversations. And I wrote a paper on it back in the day, and um, I think it does a disservice both to us and sort of the way we, white people stand in opposition to that, um, and to you know the very diverse and varied population of Native Americans, not all of whom you know identify as having this very close relationship to nature. Um, so just speaking to that, those sort of homogenizing discourses right. never do us much good, but. But I think this, um, yeah, the idea of bringing in, you know, the, the Gila region has close to 19 
different federally recognized tribes who the Forest Service consults with in planning processes. Um, so, so bringing them in as, a, as an active participant in dialogues around how the land gets managed, you know, how we use fire and, and how we're tending to, you know, the great variety of native plants that are within the Gila bioregion. Um, all of that just feels like such potent fodder for this ongoing conversation about what the future of land management in this country looks like. Right, because it's an issue of, of justice, certainly, on one hand, but it is also yes. an issue of ecology, you know, yes. because there are species, uh, different species of plants, which have not been doing as well uh, since they stopped being tended because it was tending that was itself helping them to spread and to stay healthy. I mean, there's certain root plants, for example, that were that were dug, and then the smaller roots were then uh, left in the disturbed earth, and then that's how that that plant, you know, began to spread more, you know? And so those processes have now been absent because those plants haven't been part of, you know, for the most part, haven't been part of settler, settler colonial culture. And so they've been just sort of abandoned, you know? And so it's these, it's these very strange landscapes that we're then, then, then left with, you know what I mean? To, yeah. to figure out how to, how to deal with at this point. Yeah. Yeah, and, and back to your earlier point about wilderness is this idea of a, a landscape, a forest that's devoid of man. I think that that's, that also needs to be um, revisited because there's, there's been that relationship for a long time and we're probably doing more harm by sort of extracting ourselves or extracting the idea of human interference in some capacity. Um, but it's, yeah, it's about integrating that traditional ecological knowledge and, and seeking out the advice and the wisdom of, of those who've been here far longer than we have. Right, right. And that traditional ecological knowledge itself is, has obviously been affected by the centuries of colonialism, you know, um, and because the landscapes themselves have also been affected by the centuries of colonialism, there is, I think, the, the case could be made that one cannot simply return to exactly what was happening before, but that instead it would now be something new that would be happening, uh, some kind of hybrid between old and new. But it also strikes me, just when I reflect about these things, that the methods that were used before colonization would never have been static methods in the first place either, right. but that they also would have been changing um, as things as different things happens. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you've spent some time with some indigenous folks out collecting plants and that sort of thing. Is that true? Yeah, and, and with yeah, and with people who have been have been taught with them, you know, more. Okay. But yes, I have. And and um it's been, I mean, it's been truly, truly fascinating. It's a totally different way to connect. And then, you know, I I mean, you know, you talk about the pinion pine, I'm sure you've you've, you know have eaten the, 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 the pine nuts from time to time. Mm -hmm. And when you eat a food like that, that's a wild food, you know, like, wow, there's something very different about it. You know what I mean? It's not just the flavors are more complex and they could, they usually are, but then there's feelings that you can have that can be surging, you know, through you that are both physical and emotional because it's just a really different, you know, thing that's happening there, you know? Oh yeah. 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 And so it's interesting because, you know, we can, we can critique this word of wilderness, um, the concept of wilderness, and yet there is still something to this word wild, or we need a word for something that's referring to the parts of the world that are not domesticated, because domestication is definitely a very real thing, you know, the domestication right. of a landscape. Yeah. So then how do we differentiate between what is domesticated and what is not domesticated or what was once domesticated and is now kind of going feral again or something. I mean, there is, you know, wilderness is the word we've been using and it's not the best word, but we need, there, there is something different that really is going on there though. Yeah. And I, and this is where I can kind of geek out on some of my, the theory from linguistic anthropology that, that I so appreciate because it recognizes that language, um, exists in this sort of dialogic space that its meaning is constantly being negotiated um, both between 
between you know the, the speaker and the listener, but but the history that comes along with any given word and the intention that's used, you know, at, in in every spoken utterance. Um, Mikhail Bakhtin is one of my favorite critical theorists, Russian theorists from uh, the early 20th century. He um, he had this idea that the word and language is half someone else's. So every time you, you use a word, you're sort of carrying with it this entire history that came before of every time it's been uttered. Um, and there's, like I was saying, this uh, sort of fecundity of the intention that you bring to it when you use it um, moving forward into the future. So for me, that's just a, it's a, a way of remembering that it doesn't mean we have to um, give up on the word wilderness. I think there's possibility for redefinition um, and sort of using it in, in social spaces and with a certain social gravity where we are not only reckoning with its sort of historical baggage, um, but mobilizing it into the future in a way that's more creative and kind of capacious of, um, of what it means to us now. You know, I think language evolves in that way, which I love. Yeah, no, it, it's constantly evolving. And, and um, my, my degree was writing when I was in college. And, so, and I've also been fascinated with words and with etymology, you know, my, my whole life as well. And it's, um, there definitely is something to the fact that the words we use change the way that we think. Yes. As well, you know? And so when people want to introduce new words for things, um, there's, there's, you know, there, there'll be a reaction on behalf of some people to be like, oh, that's silly, you know, but, but the thing is, is that, is that, well, things are always shifting and there are old ideas that always need to be rattled, you know, and there's old ideas that need to be pitched as well. And so language is one way to, to, to do that, you know, obviously. Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. There was something you wrote in one of your pieces here that I really liked. I'm just going to read it to you. It's just a couple of sentences, but um, you, you wrote, uh, science-driven data is important and certainly contributes to a sense of a fact-based reality. But as humans, we are both head and heart, mind and body. The more ways we can let the world inhabit both, perhaps the more likely we will be to understand our connection to it and to the other species that we share with it. And so I was really interested to hear what you have to say about that, because you definitely have science in your background and in your education. Um, and yet here you're saying uh, you're, you're talking about the fact that it has its limits. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is it's becoming um, a more common sort of um, new approach to conservation and environmentalism when I hear more and more organizations, even some of the big green groups talking about how can we tell a better story? Um, and I think that's drawing on exactly that, this recognition that um, yes, science is powerful um, and, and you can certainly maybe feel like you're being moved by reading something like 70% of bird species are in decline on the Pajarito Plateau. Um, but I am also a, a deep believer in, in a sort of more phenomenological um, explanation and uh, sort of approach to our sense of humanness and how we make meaning of the world, just meaning we inhabit these bodies, right? And so much of our time on this planet and the way we experience the world is a felt experience. It's an embodied experience. And it's easy to forget that, I think, especially this day and age when so much of um, what we're exposed to is, is data and it's sort of this, um, an appeal to the intellect and maybe not so much the body. Um, and that, again, that, that was so much of what that, my pinyon research was about, sort of going out into the world, um, into the pinyon juniper woodland and, and not even thinking, but just really trying to be a feeling creature in the world um, and, and not having it be about the brain so much as about the, the body and the heart. And I think if we, can, if we can make 
climate change and biodiversity loss more of a felt experience for, for people generally. I just think it would, um, it's, and it's not meant to be, to sort of um, trigger grief, but for me, uh, a sense of celebration of the world um, and, and why we must tend to it and be custodians of it. Um, and I think it's, it's difficult to know how to process some of that information um, purely on an intellectual level. I think it's really important that it's, it becomes embodied in some capacity, if that right. makes sense. Yeah, no, it, it does. And I think that part of the challenge too is that, I mean, I, I've spent, you know, um, parts of my life living in cities, like in the middle of big cities. And then I've definitely spent parts of my time living in rural areas too, you know, some of them quite remote, you know, like this one. And one thing I've noticed is that, and I, I'm not insulting city people at all by saying this, but people in the city don't have a sense of a lot of things that are happening in the, the natural world just because they don't have uh, any, um, any exposure, you know, to it. You know what I mean? And once yeah. people go out and walk in a forest, you know what I mean? Or see a, a big bloom of flowers in the desert in the spring, you know, or go through a, a wetland and see the amazing things that happen there. I, I think a lot of, a lot of things can change very quickly for people then, you know, but there's the practical basis of like, well, we can't really have everyone from the city marching out and going and seeing these places. Right. You know, but, but something, so, so how, how to communicate or how, how is it to try to, to bring the, to bring this reality to people who are only having contact, you know, virtually through these different devices, you know, it's a challenge. Yeah. It's a huge challenge and, and increasingly so as, as more the population of the planet is urbanized. Right. But I've read some really, I mean, it's, and that's again, sort of exploring that potentially false dichotomy of nature and culture and, right. and that the city is sort of the epitome of quote unquote civilization and therefore the opposite of wilderness. I, I'd like to experiment with thinking about the things that are wild in a city, you know, mm -hmm. that there are even the population of pigeons, you know, or as this species that's been incredibly adaptable to this totally foreign landscape or even little green spaces. I mean, some of the research that's been done on the effects on, on human psychology or um, like recovery from injury or sickness of people who are in a hospital room with a window that looks out onto something green, you know, just as like a tree that has direct implications for how our body responds to the world. So I, I just wonder if it needs to be this sort of dramatic immersion in wilderness, or if it can just be um, some kind of reformation of how we situate ourselves in whatever environment we're in, because it's all the world ultimately, right? Right, right. Right. And one thing I've noticed, because I, I, I spent some time as an organic farmer too. And so when I'm traveling around, I'm always looking at agricultural areas with a, a close eye. And one thing I've noted is that in the major agricultural areas like California Central Valley or the Midwest, that the weed management and the wildlife management at this point is so intense, you know, mm. especially over the last 20 years, as more and more crops have been introduced that can tolerate um, Roundup, you know, the Roundup ready crops, then they've used yeah. more, they've been using more herbicides, right? Um, what I've noticed is that, is that, you know, there's more biodiversity on city on certain city blocks I can think of actually just coming up in the cracks in the sidewalk than there are in like uh, you know a 40 acres somewhere of a monocrop you know what I mean where they're not allowing yeah. any weeds to be at all either so that really talks to the point that you're making too where you know uh people just need to pay attention to the, to the life that's right around them there you know absolutely yep yeah. and even I mean to, to to go even more on a on a micro scale. I, the more that we're understanding about like the, the human microbiome and the way that we are populated with, right. you know, these organisms, bacteria, like to me, that's another expression of, of wilderness in some capacity in the way it's, in, it's inescapable really. You know? Right. Right. Yeah, no, it certainly is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've also, you know, I've, I've, sometimes I've pictured what some of these cities will look like, you know, in the, in the future, 
you know, if there comes a time when there aren't so many people around, you know, and I'm like, wow, there'll be some amazing forests that will be growing in some of these cities because there's trees from literally all over the entire planet. You know what I mean? That have brought to these, brought to these places, you know, and, you know, some of them will do just fine in their new areas. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. so we'll yeah. see, we'll see these really amazing kind of wild gardens, you know, at some point, you know, and, and, um, I, I'm not, I'm not so hung up on the, the native non-native thing because I think plants have always, you know, moved around and people have always, you know, moved them around. And at this point, novel ecosystems seems to be a lot about what we're going to be dealing with, you know, at this point, yeah. you know, too, you know, because some, some landscapes have been so affected that there isn't a way to get back, you know, to right. where they were. And now with the changing climate, there's also not a way to get back to what they were because not everything that grew there is going to be something that's going to grow there, you know, again. And so that seems like something that you must be thinking about or dealing with, uh, with the work that you do as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think some of it can be, you know, managed or worked in a restorative capacity through a science-based approach through what we know from, from biology and ecology. And I, to me, another thing that I find so inspiring about um, a sort of new conception of the natural world is there are elements of adaptability that we just don't know about yet. Um, I don't know if you saw, there was an article, I think it was in the times uh, probably over a year ago about um, fresh kills landfill out on the East coast somewhere. Maybe mm-hmm. it was in New Jersey, Didn't see this one. Um, mm-hmm. but it was like, it's a, it's a retired landfill, but they're doing uh, research on this forest that's growing up out of this landfill and the way that these plants are adapting to the, the literal trash <laughs> right. that makes up the soil that they're growing in. And they're they're It's beautiful. You know, they're, uh-huh. they're healthy. And so I just think that there's a, there are things that we can't know about um, the intelligence of the natural world and its adaptive capacities. Right, right. Yeah, because life obviously has its own way, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's nothing, I would say, villainous about, you know, plants, you know, either, you know? Yeah. If a plant's growing somewhere, it's because that's the conditions that are good for that plant. And that is nature working in its way and that place that that plant is growing there. And- you know, I guess that what distresses me the most about some of these things is just when um, herbicides are brought in, in the interest of restoration. And that's just something that I can't countenance at all, because there's no way to hit, you're always going to hit non, non-target non species, you know, right. if, if you're spraying things. And then, of course, there's all the different interactions that these things have in the, in, you know, ended up having in the environment, you know, and then, you know, I did a little research a a few years ago and found out that like when the federal government was putting together its program for how to define and then how to deal with invasive species, one of the main people at the table was Monsanto, Hmm. right? Yeah. And Dow Chemical, because they were going to be selling the chemicals. And I was like, ah, okay. Yeah. So it's just, there's, there's always, you know, whenever you dig into issue, any issue, there's always these threads where you have to look and be like, okay, where's the part that's the profit motive? And let me pull exactly. that one out. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. look at this without the profit motive, please. Yeah. <laughs> to yeah. see what's and, really uh, going uh, on, you know. The dark underbelly. <laughs> it's, it's everywhere. And the use of herbicides to, to manage for, for grazing. I mean, we see that oh, in the, Gila, the, yeah. the removal of pinon and, and juniper to, you know, have better, better rangeland. And that's something else we're actively working on. I just, you know, I, I'm not anti-agriculture and I'm not anti-grazing. I just feel like in the Southwest, you know, it, it facing in the midst of this mega drought, that's only going to get worse. It's, this is, it's not a landscape that makes sense for cattle, you know, it's, right. it's just not and the and the the effects on riparian habitat and you know vulnerable species and i it's frustrating it's incredibly frustrating right right i mean especially with the public lands aspect of it where the land is you know leased or or um however it is done to the to the to the ranchers for um 
prices that are well below what it would be market, you know, if it was, right. if it was private land. And so that whole aspect of it, that's a, a public subsidy, you know, yes. and is that how we should be spending the subsidy at this point? I know that there are people right. who are working on buying out some of those allotments, aren't there? We are. Yeah. Guardians, Guardians oh, okay. does I didn't know that. kind of our, our, our sister campaign, um, my colleague, Madeline Carey, um, works on the grazing permit retirement. Um, and it's, it's been successful. The hope is that we'll at least have some kind of permanent state legislation that will be passed, um, hopefully in the next six to nine months, mm -hmm. um, which will sort of set a new precedent for the West. And then maybe we can start thinking about Colorado and Arizona or Utah doing something similar. But and that I, I love that approach as well because it's not um, it's not villainizing the ranchers. You know, it's it's recognizing that they're just trying to make a living. They just want to support their families. You know, it's it's a long tradition for them. There's a lot of identity politics that surround it, um, and it's voluntary. You know, the, the ranchers will come to us and say like, I can't do this anymore. It's not economically sustainable, and we buy them out. You know, we give them a, a chunk of cash to go start another project and um and then we buy the lease from them and then hopefully if we get legislation passed it can be permanently retired and there won't be grazing there anymore right so so exactly how does that work logistically with what you're what you're buying for them so they they lease the grazing permit through the forest service right um if they come to us and say they want to retire it we essentially buy it off of them, but in our current structure, there's no permanent way to retire that grazing permit. So we right. could hold it for 10 years and then 10 years goes by and the Forest Service says, we wanna open this up for grazing again. Um, so there needs to be a, a legislative pathway for that permit re that permanent retirement to happen, ah, um, okay. which is what we've been, what we've been pushing. Um, and we have a lot of support. We've had such an amazing delegation here in New Mexico who have done great things for um, some environmental stuff. Um, so, and they're, they're on board. So right. fingers crossed, we'll have That's it. That's cool. Mm -hmm. soon. Right, right, yep. right. And, you know, there's also, of course, a sad truth that, you know, like many other segments of the economy, especially the agricultural economy, not as much of it is family is family focused as it once was either. Yeah. A lot of it is very big and corporate at this point. And I've spent a lot of time in Eastern Oregon there. And there I found out that a lot of the places that had the appearance of being a small family run um, ranch were actually, yeah, there's a family who's there, but that isn't their land anymore. And they're just tenants. And so they're getting you know, just a, a small amount to be there. And then really who's profiting is this large corporation. A lot of those were, were, were out of, were, you know, from out of state, you know, as well. And so there's also, there's also that um, I feel for people to be educated about, which is that, which is that it's not, it, well, you know, just as there's not old McDonald, old, old McDonald anymore, you know, like just yeah. as like, there's almost no farms like that anymore. There aren't as many ranches as there were, like that anymore either, you know, as no. you know, basically everything in the US has been corporatized, you know? Yep. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So I want to ask you kind of a, a more of a enjoyable question, I think, which is which is what um so so what would you love to see? Like what are your fantasies? What is it that you would just, you know, like what's your kind of your big picture of like, you know, so so besides the little struggles and the little campaigns, all that, like like, like, can you paint us a picture of like, wow, here's what I would just love to see, you know? <laughs> um, I mean, how, like, how large scale are you talking? Oh, I don't know, wherever. Like, yeah. Biggest dreams? Yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> I mean, obviously I have, I'm deeply attached to the greater Gila bioregion and, and the, the 10 million acres that, um, that make it up cross-border southwest New Mexico and southeastern Arizona and the Sky Islands I just that is such a, um, a special ecosystem and also um, one of the most threatened in the United States by climate change and biodiversity loss so I work on this campaign I'm deeply attached to it I think it would be so incredible to have the sort of southern capstone of the Rockies be some large landscape designation in the greater Gila 
Um, and as you know, it's, it's an incredible place. It's wild and it's rugged and um, a ton of um, inventoried roadless areas and three different wilderness places and home to the Mexican gray wolf, which we were fortunate enough to see three of them um, over the summer in the Gila. Have you seen any in your time there? I've not seen any personally, no. No. No, no. I Heard didn't. Them? No, well, not that I know of, you know. I did <laughs> okay. an interview uh, earlier with Amy Harwood about the uh, about the Mexican wolves here, though. Yeah, 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 yeah they're, they're so extraordinary. And then I, you know, I think on a, maybe a more philosophical or, or cosmological or paradigm shift level, I, I just see, and I, it's, it, to me, it's more of a, like a Western way of being in the world, but I would love for us to feel what it's like to be, um, you know, creatures on this planet in a way that, that was more meaningful. I would love it to be a, a sort of cultural shift that that's something that we, you know, we, we raise our children to be aware of and that we celebrate together um, being out in the world and that we just feel more embodied and, and emboldened in that connection to, to this planet. Um, to me, that's such a, a potent sort of way of identifying myself. Um, and I, and I see, yeah, I, I see a sort of sense of loneliness and listlessness that comes with a disconnection from that. And I think it's difficult, you know, culturally, we don't, um, we don't support that sort of way of being in the world. Um, and it's quite the opposite. But in my, in my dream world, I think we would all come to inhabit that space um, more meaningfully and, and feel like our lives were, were richer because of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have similar, similar things that I, that I dream about because I think that the current system as it is, is actually making very few people happy when it really comes down to it. You know, like most people, um, they would prefer a life where they don't have to go to a grind, you know, and like, like, you know, the, the, the do the, the struggles that they have to, you know, for rent and for food and all these things. I mean, you know, for, for me, I would see a world where, um, the necessities of life are demonetized, you know, and we can keep money and that's for rich people to use for buying diamond rings and sports cars, if that's really what they want. <laughs> but then when it comes to the things that you actually need, no, that, that isn't paid for in some other way of, you know, of, of, of when, and we have models, you know, and there were ways that this was done before, you know, and, and so, and I know that there's no, there's no going back, but at the same time, the, where we're at right now, just isn't, this is, this isn't going to do it, obviously, you know, like no. this, this is kind of taking us in a, in a, in a, in a, in a disastrous, you know, sort of, sort of direction, you know, so, yeah. you know, and you're, and you're a mom, so you must have your own sort of concerns about the future in that way. I'm actually a stepmother or mm -hmm. I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not married to my partner, but I live with, um, with his two teenage girls and, I've spent a lot of time thinking about um, what it means to be a woman and to choose to not have children and, right. and also, you know, to have a presence in the lives of um, these young women trying to be a positive influence. And um, yeah, it's all, it's all so complicated, you know, and sort of shot through with larger considerations of global health and, um, and the fact that we have a choice, I mean, that to me, that's an, a pretty incredible thing to consider and incredible privilege. And, um, and there are many ways to be a mother, you know, I think that's true as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, to wrap this up, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, Wild Earth Guardians and kind of what you do there and how people can follow what you do and how they can support it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are a Westwide organization. We've been around for um, over 40 years now. Um, and we really, our mission statement is to um, preserve and protect the, the wild places, wild rivers and wildlife and general health of the American West. We have a bunch of really cool campaigns right now um, to protect the gray wolves, which were just delisted. Um, we do a lot of work on the Rio, which is um, such an exploited river and, and a river that I love. 
Um, so you can visit wildearthguardians.org um, to find out more about our programs. And in our wild places, you'll see the, the Greater Gila campaign, um, which we're working on and learn a little bit more about that region and, and the work that we do there. Cool. Well, thanks so much for spending some time today with me. I really yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Calibri. It was a pleasure. All right. Thank you. Take care. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.